APS is sponsored by Orange on 6th. Orange specializes in vintage clothing, retro housewares, and current fashion and accessories to make yourself juicy. Orange also offers visitors the chance to recycle clothing to keep you in the mix. Open Tuesday through Saturday, 12 to 5, and open late on Wednesdays and Fridays. Orange, located at 3715 6th Avenue and online at orangetacoma.com. Good morning, everybody. You're listening to 90.1 KUPS The Sound. I'm the host, Casey Krolchek, and you're listening to Across Campus. Uh, this is a radio show where I invite students on the air every week, and I will introduce them to you guys, but basically they get to set the agenda. So this is an opportunity for them to get their ideas and their voices out on the air. And so this week we have the Students for a Sustainable Campus. We have Niki Polizotto. Annie Begalki, Sarah Eg Egger, and Annie, Be Annie Begalki here in the studio with us today. So, And Jacob Gelman, my bad. We've got four guests. We have more people in here than we've ever had. So I'm just going to introduce them to you. So I guess if, Sarah, if you, got, if you want to start out, like what's your, what's your major? What have you been, what have you been doing around campus? Um, I'm a history major, environmental studies or policy minor. Um, I spend like... A lot of my time with sustainability community. Um, not only am I events coordinator for our Students Sustainable Campus, but I'm also the green advocate for um, RSA and Res Life. Um, and I sit on um, Sustainability Advisory Committee Outreach Committee with Annie. Um, so spend a lot of time doing that. All right, very cool. And how did life lead you to? becoming involved with Students for a Sustainable Campus? Like, who was, who was that figure? What was that event in your life that led you to that? Um, well, I was really involved in sustainability in high school, and so kind of immediately when I got to campus, I was trying to find the sustainability community. And when I saw they had a table at Log Jam last year, I immediately signed up um, to be an SSC. Um, and I actually, like, dropped off a little bit um, the first semester last year, but ended up getting back into it second semester. And then when I applied to be Green Advocate for RSA, I kind of got more into it and um, have kind of been pretty involved ever since. Well, I think, I think that's one of the really nice things about clubs at Puget Sound. Like, you can, some of them you'll kind of float into at different, at different points during your Puget Sound career, uh, but the, the option is always there for you to come back, so... It's very flexible, and that's what that's what I've enjoyed about it. All right, very cool. Annie, what's your what's your major? Where are you from? Okay, um, my major is international political economy with an environmental policy minor, and I'm from Minnesota originally. I'm a junior. Um, I guess kind of similar to Sarah, I got involved with sustainability in high school, um, and it's, I feel like it's one of those things that like once you start, it just kind of leads to another thing and another thing, and before you know it, you're spending more time organizing and talking about sustainability than you are on homework and <laughs> um, I don't know it's it kind of it's building on itself it's great very cool and did you have any impor important figures or like people that like I mean what was, what was like the point like you said it started in high, in, in high school but like what gets yeah. you on that path like what happens I guess I got involved because my sister needed a ride to uh, her environmental club and um, I guess I kind of I was driving her there out of kind of like you know, being forced by my parents who didn't want to drive her all the way across Minneapolis. And I ended up sitting there and, you know, just listening to what they were talking about and realizing that, you know, this is something that everyone can connect to. Um, we need we need people working around this that, you know, at some point it is going to be our responsibility and that there's a lack of responsibility for our own actions and that um, this is, like, the best time to do it, that I feel like right now we're kind of at a turning point and that, People are starting to realize that sometimes the way that we live doesn't always work and that we can make small changes to fix that. Sounds beautiful. Nikki? Hi, I'm Nikki, and I'm a sophomore here at UPS, and I'm a comparative sociology major and an environmental policy minor. And I, like Annie and Sarah, got involved in environmentalism in high school, and it's just kind of blossomed, blossomed from there. And I'm president of the SSC this year, which has been, like, really fun and exciting. And um, I'm involved with some other environmental groups out, outside of uh, the Puget Sound community. And um, 
I guess what what really started getting me involved was my dad. Um, he has his own environmental company, and he's been really like a model for me in terms of uh, what what I would like to do with with my time and and what's important to me. And um, I've worked pretty closely with the Waterkeeper Alliance for a long time, and um, just seeing how our waterway is going to affect. Um, every aspect of our lives and just devoting yourself to a cause like that 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 really does affect everyone and uh, we can do things to make sure that um, we're moving forward in the right direction and and protecting ourselves and protecting the ecosystems around us I think that's really important well, I think that's really cool that you had your dad kind of lead you into this because I mean and you've told me about his company before and it sounds really cool so could you tell us a little bit more about that um yeah I I'm not the best one to to, to explain sure, sure. his business yeah. model because it's a little bit complicated. Um, he takes ad spend dollars and puts them towards community um, projects within cities and counties um, th- through advertisement. So major corporations will buy his advertisement through um, like outdoor signage and most recently commercials through the eco ad. Um, and he signs contracts with cities. So um, those cities have to use those funds that they get from those advertisements and put them towards um, environmental projects like putting solar panels on schools or um, like retrofitting retrofitting buildings. Um, I don't know, school gardens has been a big thing. But um, yeah, seeing, seeing someone like innovate a company and... and take what is historically not a um, environmentally friendly business and and making it one um, and setting a precedent for socially conscious media um, that that doesn't just send a message but ac- but actually does something um, has, has been it's really crea- it's creating the agenda like setting the image yeah around. yeah and I, I think that's what's really helped me is like I, I want to go out and do things like sending a message is is really important but but also getting out there and, and Doing concrete things to make concrete results is really important. Well, that's cool. I know my parents were really influential in where I am now and where I'm heading, so I thought that'd be cool to try and draw that out for our <laughs> listeners. Uh, rounding out our cozy group here in the studio today, Jacob, uh, what's your major? Where are you from? And how'd you get involved with Students for a Sustainable Campus? Um, I am a double major in economics and business. Um, I'm actually in the business leadership program, and uh, my minor is environmental policy. Pretty hard to fit in all those things. <laughs> um, but uh, so I'm from around Portland. It's uh, the suburb to the north on the Washington side. It's Vancouver, Washington. And um started thinking about sustainability when I was in high school because I, I grew up in kind of one of the classic like rural towns that turned ultra suburban in my lifetime, um, and I I grew up watching a lot of open spaces develop into cookie-cutter houses, um, and I didn't even really realize the gravity of it until I started studying it in high school and uh, studying how widespread the suburban sprawl is. So that that's what got me thinking about sustainability, and um, then I interned with the Sierra Club in Portland this past summer. Um, uh, working on coal exports, which I guess we're going to talk about soon. Um, and I had never really been involved in many student groups on campus, and I just said, you know, i got to make time. All right, very cool. And so this is always an interesting question for clubs that I have on the show. Like, if somebody asks you what are the students for a sustainable campus, what sort of definition do you give them or what do you tell them? I guess anybody can pick up that question. Um, I would say that anyone who's who's interested in sustainability, and I, I would say, yeah, the the thing that makes SSC a, a solid group is just the like mindedness of understanding that there is an urgent issue at hand, and um, making our campus aware of that issue, and making sure that um, our school. Um, whether it's the students or the faculty, um, is making sure that we're doing everything in our power to to make it um, more sustainable 
and environmentally friendly, whatever that may be. All right, very cool. Well, that's the pitch that you would get if you go to Log Jam or talk to anybody else to anybody else in the club. It's a uh, it's a really in inclusive club. I, I went to my first meeting uh, this last week and really enjoyed it. They have a great variety of people there. And then as far as far as club structures go, it, it was one of the most organized that I have yet to go to. Like I, I was I was really impressed how there were several different subcommittees. It seemed like everybody had something that they wanted to speak about. Individual members of the club knew what they knew what they were working on and had something to report back to the club. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah, I think one cool thing about that is that it's fairly new. Um, my freshman year was a year that it just started up again, and um, I remember going to meetings throughout the year and I'd just be there, you know, students would be talking about how frustrated they were about sustainability on campus, and it just kept like perpetuating this like discussion and this frustration, and. Um, I think like so last year, we decided that we were going to start doing more work and less talking, um, <laughs> so, which is nice. And then it kind of like just became a lot of work. And then kind of near the end of the year, we decided that like, okay, we have like different things going. Let's make it very defined and clear and put roles to it um, and create more of a structure around it. And so that's kind of how we entered this year with more of a structure to it, more expectations, more goals. Um, and it's led to a lot of really great success, I feel like. Yeah, as someone who's just joined this year, um, I've been so incredibly impressed by by the level of leadership, but also just the level of individual responsibility that people in each subcommittee or in the larger group take upon themselves. Um, it, people are really self-motivated. Yeah, I think one of the great things that we kind of did this year, other than um, having kind of a core set of leaders, which has been really great to um, kind of keep things organized and keep things from getting kind of off track, but like creating subcommittees on specific topics has kind of put the responsibility on the members of the club instead of on like the five leaders. Um, we created a uh, um subcommittee around coal, um, which Jacob and Andy are going to talk about, and around dining conference services, and around composting. So that way the students can feel invested in something specific and can follow an issue throughout the year instead of just working on one individual project. And then when it's over, they're like, well, what do I do now? I don't know how I'm invested in this club as a whole. So this kind of like creates a really nice community that's enthusiastic about some really great subjects. I, I think for me, um, what, what, what's most important um, in leading SSC this year is um, being a facilitator and having the club um, be a medium for any student who's interested in environmentalism or sustainability be able to get what they want done, done, and um, creating that motivation and that um, support system that that is needed to um create whatever idea or project they have um, and, and make it successful and make it something they're proud of. Um, so, yeah, that's that's really my main goal for this year. Well, that's really cool. Uh, I think one of the most impressive things about the Students for Sustainable Campus is that they, they've been taking uh, distinct action on topics that they're really interested in. And it's not just a group that we get together and where you, where you get together and talk and talk about how awful things are going with the environment. <laughs> you know? Like the, the point is really to take action, and we'll we'll talk about this more in the, uh, later in the show. But uh, that is definitely one of the keystone features of this club. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to ninety point one KUPS, the sound. All right, we're back on ninety point one KUPS, the sound. You're listening to the show across campus, and I'm your host Casey Krolchek. We've got Students for a Sustainable Campus here in the studio with us today, so we're going to jump into our next segment. And we're just going to be talking about the history of the club because this is, this is actually like a pretty young and up-and-coming club here at the University of Puget Sound. So, Annie, you were kind of part of the central leadership last year, but tell me how that kind of came to be. Um, sure. So, as I mentioned earlier, freshman year, well, two years ago, um, we were we got a lot of like-minded students together, which is really important for, you know, if you want to make any changes, you need to get people who have similar values to start talking and discussing. Um, and then 
Um, but that really, I felt like that that's important as long as you have direct action that's followed by that. Um, so last year, that was kind of our emphasis was taking out these people who are very connected in those values and having them actually work and get something done. Um, so we started the year kind of trying to figure out what we wanted to do and deciding that um, we wanted to do garbology. So we did a study of the trash. I think we had about 50 different garbage bags from around campus, and we threw them all out on a big tarp and like started separating them and showing campus, okay, like this is this could be recycled. We were throwing this in the trash. Let's compare this. And then we went around with surveys and asked people, you know, like how much they recycle, you know, about their knowledge of recycling. So that was one of our first projects. I remember seeing that out, like, on a tarp in front of... It was, yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was like, a rainy of... day, and everyone had their, like, little claws out mm -hmm. to, like, separate... Was it out in front of the sub? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, was... yeah, I did see that last year. Yeah, so... Um, but that's kind of difficult because it kind of relies on facilities to help, and they're already kind of pushed the max. So um, it was a good one-time thing. Uh, another thing we did was 350. Um, we made a big shape of 350 out of humans, um, kind of representing that there's 350, um, 350 million parts per billion of carbon emissions, ga greenhouse gases, and that that's where we should be and that we're beyond that at 380. And so all around the world we connected with different movements and had that display. Um, we had student market, which um, I feel like people are becoming really familiar with, which is really great. Um, we started working on Focus in Nations, which is a, a conference that is popping up all over the country that's focused on clean energy. Um, but it's pretty amazing. We have students who organize the conference and invite other students, professors. We invited middle school students um, as a great way to start talking about sustainability and the environment. Um, and then, let's see, what else did we work on last year? Transalta. Transalta. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And so, what, um, what is what is Transalta for people who haven't heard of that before? Well, Transalta is uh, the last coal-fired power plant in Washington State. It's in Centralia, which is uh, sort of toward the southwest of the state, sort of near where I live. Um, and uh, coal's the dirtiest fossil fuel. So, I guess do you, do you want to talk more about? Yeah. So. Um, the plant was proposed to shut down within like 50 years, I believe, and so that there were um, different environmentalists organizing, trying to say like, okay, we need to shut this down sooner. This is our last coal plant in Washington. We can like move beyond this and cut cut it down and be the first state to have no coal burned, um, which we got to have the we have the plant shut down by 2015, which is better than it was before. Um, so we were successful in that. Um, I think, isn't it 2025? Yeah, you're right. 2025. Yeah, I think that's yeah. the yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It, We wanted it to be 2015, but we got it to 2025, which is better than 2050. So we succeeded in that way. Um, but what we did as students is we went around to the petitions and talked to students about this coal plant, um, which is a something that we really focus on at Students of Sustainable Campus, and that it's important to, one, you know, educate ourselves, but then also educate the student body. Because um, there's a lot of things happening in Washington that you kind of don't know about when you're in this little bubble sometimes. Um, so that was important for us to do. Well, I think it's, it's also important because the majority of students that go to Puget Sound are not from Washington State. Like, mm -hmm. Washingtonians are kind of a minority. Definitely. <laughs> like, in, 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 in yeah. their own state yeah. here on this campus. Like, I, I, can't, I can't remember... I, if I remember correctly, like a third of this incoming class is from California. Yeah. There are a lot of students from, wow. from Colorado. The Bay, Bay Area. Yeah. yeah. Bay Area. I feel like every yeah. single person I meet is from the Bay Area. Yeah, Bay Area is really big. Hawaii is really big. Minnesota is really big. Uh, and we do have all 50 states represented here. Mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, it, it's vital to in, informing the student population about like stuff that's going on in this state is, is vital because most of us are not even from here. Mm -hmm. I think the other issue is that um, people, a lot of people aren't as well informed as you think. Um, and I think that's like, especially with, with something like coal, it's one of those things where I think a lot of people have like the bare minimum knowledge. You're like, oh, it's dirty. Oh, we probably shouldn't be burning it. But um, they're not as invested as others. And so it's great when you have a club like SSC that goes out and is super invested in it because they can get other people really invested in it and excited about um, this issue because like we are really enthusiastic about doing something about it. So. 
and even not invested, just aware. I think awareness is a really key part to sustainability is that people don't always, it's hard to understand, you know, what effects you have on your environment and your community if you don't directly see them. And I think burning coal is one of those big things that you don't really think about because you don't always see it right away, but you see the effects of it long term. Um, and so that's one thing that we did is we went around with petitions and we got over 300 and brought it to Senate with a resolution um, saying that we acknowledge that burning coal is dirty to the environment and that we are trying to transition beyond that and that we want to see the plant closed um, by 2025. So we got that passed. And then we went to Olympia. What, sorry, what point was that? Like, when did you get that resolution passed? I, think, I believe it was last, last, last spring. spring. Okay, like, yeah, I probably, just, I just wanted I'm to give not a, sure what date it was. Yeah, I just wanted so, to give, like, a general time frame yes. to listeners. Uh, so we're, we're in, last we're in, April. Okay, I so, think we're in, so. Like, so we're in spring of last year. Yeah, yeah. spring of oh, last year. year. Well, I guess of this year. This year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, last yeah. school year. Different academic year, still the same calendar year. Huh, that puts it into perspective. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so that was really cool. Then we got, I think it was about five students who go to Olympia, and um, it's there's in Washington we have Environmental Priority Day, which is all the environmental groups that are working come together and they choose four bills that they want to work on, which is really nice because that means that rather than having a bunch of different groups coming in and talking about all these different bills, it's kind of putting a priority on four things, which kind of brings all these different groups together in a way that they're working together and um, also helps politicians recognize what's really important to Washington right now. And so Cole was one of them. And so we got to go and lobby with other students, other different sustainability groups. And um, it was a really great way for us to get more involved beyond our campus and our greater Washington community. Now, that's interesting. Like you said that you said that they had like Lots of environmentals all come to the Capitol that day. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's Olympia's way of just getting everybody out of the way for the rest of the year? Or, <laughs> or, do, or, do, you, or do you think it was an effective way of like having a unified voice and having like a day where you could all make a very solid impact? You know, it was interesting because that day there were also workers from the coal plant there. Um, there are almost more workers there who were defending their jobs. Um, and that's, I think, one reason why they chose to go there is that was the day that the bill was on the floor. Um, and I think that was, like, why they chose to do that. I think there were people lobbying throughout the year, but if you get everyone together that day and then all the workers are there, it was a great way to, one, hear what the workers were saying because that's an important piece of sustainability is that everyone can benefit from it, including the people who work there because I know a lot of them were worried about their jobs. Um, and that was a key piece of the policy that there was a transition from working in the coal plant to new, more sustainable jobs. Um, and that's still kind of in the works. Um, but they've got until 2025, so. Yeah. And that's some, that's some, that's <laughs> and it's only been a couple months at this point, and that's going to be something that takes a lot of time, um, which will be exciting to hear what happens. But hopefully within the next couple of years we'll hear. But, um, yeah, do you guys want to? Well, and so the, the next question that I had, like, you start you started out, like, Annie, you started your freshman year, you, like, you said that the club really wasn't all that well-grounded your first year. You got to your sophomore year, and you started to, and you established, like, a more legitimate club. That's, like, making, that's, like, taking action and getting out there and making an impact in, at, in the Puget Sound community and also in Washington, and then I guess you can say, like, that, I mean, cutting down our own emissions is affecting the entire world. Uh... Mm -hmm. How did you? How do you keep that momentum going? And I, and I would like other club members to speak to that too, because uh, Nikki is the new president of the club, and that I'm and I'm assuming that's part of the transition. Hmm. So, what did that look like? Um, a Annie made it quite easy for me to um, like find an example of hmm. of how I wanted to run the club. Hmm. Um, so it, it was it was a very easy. <laughs> Um, transition, I would say, <laughs> and uh, I I think what's what's changed th this year in terms of how we've run the club is creating more positions. Um, we now have a president, a secretary, who also doubles as our um, technology coordinator. He's created a blog, um, and we have a Facebook page. So that's been a really useful tool in terms of 
getting our message out there and um, advertising what we're doing around campus. Um, so, so that's been good. Um, we also have an event coordinator, a publicity coordinator, and volunteer, volunteer coordinator. coordinator. So within those positions, we're able to, to narrow down and solidify what we want to do. So we have core meetings um, every Monday, usually, um, that, that sets our agenda for our Tuesday meeting when the whole group gets together. And the size varies. Um, usually we have a, like a, a decent showing, usually around 20 kids, I would say. Yeah, I was going to say there were at least that many yeah. this last week when I and was there. Yeah, I think that um, one of the strengths of SSU right now is that it's gotten uh, big enough where uh, to address your question about momentum, it's like people are friends and are and mm -hmm. become friends and say, hey, you're my friend. Let's come to this SSE event because it's going to be fun, you know? And I think that there's power, there's power in networks is what I'm saying. Oh, for sure. Completely. I think the other thing is that, like, the more organized we are... Um, we show to members of the club that it's successful and that it's worth coming because I think one issue, one flaw um, with some clubs is that they get so off track that the people, they show up and they're like, well, what's what's the point? What am I here for? What am I doing? Um, it doesn't seem like anything's getting done. So when a club is really well organized and the members feel like they're invested in something and really have... Um, something to go for then like enthusiasm builds and momentum builds and like then things can actually get done yeah i i i would like to show like a, a level of professionalism within our club um I, even though it is a student-run organization i think main maintaining an idea that 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 this is this is an important event and it should be taken seriously and um organization and professionalism is only going to benefit our club so that that's what i've really been striving for this year is is making it a organized and solidified group all right we're going to take a quick break uh this is across campus on, on kups 90.1 we have students for a sustainable campus in the studio with us today Stay with us. We'll be right back in a few minutes. Global warming. It's real. There's no debate. Harp seals need solid ice to survive. Yet the ice is disappearing. Despite this bleak outcome, there's an even greater threat to seals. Man. Canada kills thousands of seals each year. Tell the government this hunt must end. Visit StopTheSealHunt.org to take action today and help IFAW create a better world for animals and people. The Sound. All right, we're back on Across Campus. You're listening to 90.1 KUPS, The Sound, and I am the host, Casey Krolchek. Today in the studio, we've got the students for the uh, Sustainable Campus. And in this next segment, we're going to have Jacob talk to us about a project on coal that the club has been working on. Yeah, so uh, I sort of got involved um, with the Sierra Club this past summer. Uh, Sierra Club, one of the premier environmental organizations, um, has made this one of their top priorities. Uh, essentially, they, there are these huge, huge coal deposits in the Powder River Basin, um, which is over in Montana and Wyoming. And uh, I guess the U.S. has the biggest coal deposits in the world right now, we're kind of the Saudi Arabia of coal, if you will. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, essentially, these two coal companies want to strip mine that coal and send it to China. And uh, strip mining is one of the worst forms of mining. It just completely it gives a facelift to the landscape, um, and it causes irreparable damage. So, over there in the Powder River Basin, they're affected. And so, these coal companies want to export it to Asia. <laughs> And to get the coal there, they have to send it out the West Coast, and we live on the West Coast. So they want to they wanna ship this coal in uncovered rail cars, and it would come through Washington, uh, through Spokane, down the Columbia River Gorge, and then back up. Um, there are a couple export proposals right now, one in uh, Longview and one in Bellingham and one in Grays Harbor, Washington, which is sort of uh, out on the western tip. Um, and so they want to build these export terminals to send to send coal 
Um, and they ship the coal. They would ship it in uncovered rail cars. So the coal dust blows out and it gets into our communities along the way. Um, and, you know, it gets into the water. So anybody eating fish is affected. It gets into the air. So it gets into our lungs. Um, I mean, this is a serious human health concern. And, uh, I mean, coal is toxic. It has lead, mercury, arsenic in it. And we don't want to be breathing this stuff in. Like, if it got shipped through Bellingham, anywhere that you see rail lines in the town, that could be coal, you know, every day. And the coal dust travels far enough to get here. It can travel about 20 kilometers. We're talking about breathing in coal dust every day. And these would be the biggest coal export terminals in the northern hemisphere if they built them. It's massive. Right now, they export 24 million tons of coal a year in Virginia, and they would be doing up to 60 million tons a year over in Bellingham, which is just massive. And so, once they so so we're affected here, and then they ship it to China, and China burns it with low pollution controls, and it contributes to global warming more than any other fossil fuel. So, I mean, we're going to stop it. Yeah, that's a top. That's a topic that plays into. A lot of different theories of international political economy, and that's one of the majors here at Puget Sound. And in the intro course last year, we talked about uh, pollution of poverty or pollution of wealth. And we looked at poor developing countries like India and up-and-coming powers like China. And the United States has been quick to point out, the, the United States has been quick to, to point out, despite our own high levels of consumption and uh, expenditure of fossil fuels, that Countries like India and China are also putting out just as much or more uh, greenhouse gases into the environment. And but one of the but one of the things that uh, my professor pointed out was that in countries like those where exports they're, they're an export led economy, and so a lot of the products that they're making and shipping to the United States are being ma are being made using using energy from coal from the United States. And then on top of that, like, we're paying for those exports. We're the ones that are buying those from China, from India. And so, like, in a sense, like, we're bankrolling the pollution in other countries in addition to creating our own. Yeah, I mean, I think from an environmental justice standpoint, like, we don't want to turn Washington into a dumping ground for coal so that Chinese people can get more sick than they already are. I mean, I, everyone sees the photos of Beijing, how polluted it is. I think that's totally, like, right on, on yeah. point. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, to add on to that, I think sustainability at the very essence is like understanding and recognizing the interconnectedness between everyone and every being. And that this is a really great example where we are taking coal from Montana, which goes right through Washington, um, what goes right through Tacoma. It's going to go right along the Sound, which is already a super fun site, which, which is going to be dumping more mercury. Um, and then we're sending it over to China to put up into their air which gonna, is going to go over the seas, hit the Cascades, and come right back to us and create acid rain. And that not only are we polluting other areas, but it's going to come back to us as well, that, you know, that there's this larger system, and that um, we do need to take responsibility by how we affect you know, not only their air quality, but ours as well. All right, we do have somebody calling into the radio right now. We do hear that you're calling, but we're going to actually wait until we have a break. So call back when we play our next song, but we'd love to hear from you. But yeah, back to back to what we were talking about before. Um, so what what kind of reaction have you had from the student population as you've pushed uh, this movement? Um, you know, I guess one of the biggest um, one of the biggest surprises for me is seeing how many people I, I've met. I mean, we table a lot um, in the sub uh, student union building, and I'm just surprised to meet so many people who are skeptical of climate change still. Um, there was a recent study by National Academy of Sciences showing that 97% of climatologists support the science behind human-caused global climate change. I mean, it's not, it's not a debate. It's portrayed as a debate in the media, but it's a consensus, a scientific consensus. And so I've just been surprised to see how many people are, are still questioning it. You know, I guess I don't have an issue if people don't agree with climate change. Uh, more the fact that I feel like you have to understand that um, burning coal, um, it affects air quality. And that, you know, you're going to develop greater rates of asthma. Acid rain is going to, you know, hurt the ecosystem. It hurts our own, you know, 
our own beings as well in that, um, you know, whether or not you believe in this, like, larger, you know, thing as climate change, um, that are direct, you know, you see these changes right now already. Yeah. And that you do have to start, you know, curbing some of our actions to kind of meet those. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that what's most important is, like, how it affects us here. And I just, I think that it's really hard to for people to envision um, something that isn't happening right now, but, like, it really does affect us here at home. Like, when China burns burns coal, prevailing winds bring it back across the sea, uh, across the Pacific Ocean. Um, one of the major sources of mercury in Washington right now is uh, from coal pollution from China right now that gets deposited into the soil. So um, I just... I. I want people to be able to see how it affects us here. Well, one of the, one of the exciting things about the, the Students for a Sustainable Campus is this resolution. I think it's really cool that the club is, t- is taking a stance on a political action and then take, not, not just like keeping it at the club level, you've also pushed it into the ASUP Senate. And so tell me about that, pro- tell me about that process. Like, at what point did you decide that you wanted to go to a Senate, and how did you get that resolution passed, making your statement on coal? Yeah, so um, we are one of many universities in the Northwest organizing uh, against coal exports right now. Um, schools like Western Washington University, uh, University of Oregon, Pacific University, uh, Willamette and Whitman, and Reed College. Um, All these schools, I'm sure I'm leaving some out, uh, are organizing against coal exports. And so we're all passing resolutions in our own schools to say that our student bodies are against the export of coal. Um, Last year, when we passed the the Transalta coal plant resolution saying that we didn't support the burning of coal, um, we, we wanted to build off of that and say, hey, we don't support exporting coal at all. So we're the first of any of these universities to get a resolution passed. Um, saying that the student body is against it, and uh, there are many more to follow. And we're all delivering these resolutions together as one unified group of students in the Northwest saying we don't, we don't want to be affected by this. Yeah, I think it's important to, if you want to see changes, and if you want to see larger changes, that you need to find people to work with and um, allies, and that... Um, there are a lot of great things that you can do as an individual, but there are even greater things that you can do as a collective. And I think that's something that we've really tried to do, at, you know, with SSC is, you know, kind of branch out. And um, whether or not people agree with us, um, at least they're recognizing that there is, you know, something larger going on in Washington. I'm really hoping that members of other clubs are listening to this particular section because it's something that I want clubs at the University of Puget Sound to do on a more regular basis, like take a stance on an issue in the community, uh, an issue facing the state, mm-hmm. the country, wh- whatever it is, you, I would really love to see our clubs t- like take more of a defined stance on, on issues and then follow through by taking that to the Senate and passing a resolution in which the student body uh, will come out and support like a specific issue and make an impact. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Across Campus on 90.1 KUPS, The Sound. All right, we're back. You're listening to Across Campus on 90.1 KUPS, The Sound. I'm your host, Casey Krolchek, and today in the studio we have Students for a Sustainable Campus. So in this last segment of the show, like we're just going to kind of be wrapping things up, and I'd love to know more about like what the, what the club is working on like right now on campus. Like What are some of the projects that you guys have going? I'll take the lead on that. Um... I right now we have three subcommittees that we mentioned before: um, composting, dining services, and the Beyond Coal movement. Um, we just talked about the Beyond Coal movement in um, quite a bit of depth, so I'll, I'll, I'll move on from that. Um, in terms of composting, right now we don't have any facilities on campus. Um, or off campus <laughs> that do g- composting, and we um, create a lot of waste that could be composted. So I think there's a general sense of um, unfulfillment on that part 
on campus. Um, you just see the need for like yeah, service. Yeah, th- there's there's yeah. there's a serious serious need for composting um, on I think campus. It's important to mention that that it is in the works. Yeah, um, yeah. it's just difficult with how the kitchen's set up now, and that there is mm-hmm. a lot of discussion, and we're really lucky as students to have. Um, a lot of staff and employees be supporting sustainability right. efforts, okay. and that's with yeah. um, the Sustainability Advisory Committee, which is which meets once a month, um, and they also have different subgroups that work on organizing. So they've just done a stars rating system where they looked at the campus, and that's one area that they identify they really need to work on. Another one is education, which is really great for SSC to kind of plug into, and mm-hmm. that's one thing that we've been really working on. If you guys want to speak to some education. Um, yeah, it's la- last year we, I, I should have filmed um, Running Dry during Earth Day, um, and I, this year I hope to be showing more documenta- documentaries and facilitating discussions of, about what we see. Um, so I think that's an important and, and interesting way of making the campus community a- aware of, of what is going on. Yeah. Another thing that I feel like we, we try to do is um, incorporate education into all of our activities. Mm-hmm. So something that um, we're trying to do this year is um, kind of facilitate um, off-campus activities and projects, but that incorporate um, some kind of educational factor into them. Um, for example, we um, went to um, this farm, Terry's Berries, on Saturday, um, and I think that's a great way to kind of um, get students enthusiastic about um, getting involved in SSC because it's something fun that you can go to. We went and we, like, pressed our own apple cider and we picked pumpkins, and it was really delicious, but um, the great thing about a project like that and um a field trip like that is that you can incorporate education about sustainable agriculture and organic farming into a event that you're going to get a lot more excitement over because it's yeah. when you think about it it's like oh i'm going to go to a farm and pick pumpkins this is going to be really fun um but it's a great way to kind of incorporate um education into something that you already know people are going to be enthusiastic about yeah and i, I think it also creates a sense of local community um and outreach outside of of University of Puget Sound it's like there there's some really awesome things going on yeah. in the the greater Tacoma Seattle area and getting involved in things like that is is really important for the for the SSC I think one thing that um, we're trying to work on, um, and this is also through Sustainability Advisory Committee outreach which is kind of going to bridge um, a gap between um, the outside community and Puget Sound is we're trying to get a farmer's market on campus um, during the winter months, and um, that's something that I think will really create um, a good like connection between um, off-campus and on-campus students um, and kind of also educate, um, again, students on like sustainable agriculture and on local farming and the importance of um, buying local and understanding where your food comes from. So yeah, we've we've had one um, farmers market out, outing to the Proctor Farmers Market, and then we had a potluck actually at my house, um, and that was a really great way of just getting SSC students together for something fun, um, because sustainability is fun. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is like we we do a lot of serious things, but um, also creating a sense of like we're all friends and we're all interested in the same thing, and and having like a fun relaxed night is is uh, a a great thing to do <laughs> well going back to that uh like what you guys said about connecting with the community i think it's really great that you guys have made that effort to connect with tacoma and the larger uh i guess just wa- washington state yeah like i think that's one of the, the that's one of the dangers of going like not really dangerous it's one, it's one of the things that you one of the things that you risk when you go to a small school is that you become isolated and a lot of people will describe the school as being a bubble <laughs> and so you kind of live in the Puget Sound bubble, and it's 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 its own little world in and of itself. But uh, I love I love to see it when students are pushing off campus and connecting Tacoma with the school and the school at Tacoma. Yeah. So I'm really glad that you guys are are working on that. So yeah, right now um, I'm tr- I'm trying to get the SSC involved with these these uh, community gardens in Hilltop um, <clears throat> that s- serve as as a real central figure in some underprivileged communities within the Tacoma area and uh actually yeah Hilltop um had the number one homicide block in the country and they've transformed part of that into a community garden um so there's a lot of things being done outside I know that they've expanded their farmer's market 
by introducing two new farm, three new farmers markets within the last two years. And um, there's now yeah. a co-op, you know, that just started. Yeah, the over on six. co-op. So really connecting oh, yeah. with those different things that are starting up um, has been really exciting. It is really exciting. Uh, students. Yeah. Yeah. All right, and we don't have that much time left, but I've heard rumors about to-go containers in the cafeteria. <laughs> Can you guys give me the inside scoop on that? Um, so basically, um, the issue is that um, the Dining Conference Services has been working to kind of um, reduce the use of um, the to-go uh, dishes and the paper dishes um, because those are really unsustainable because they get thrown in the garbage. Um, the, one of the main issues is that they are um, like biodegradable or compostable. However, because we don't have compost, um, they just get thrown in the garbage, um, and that's a major issue because that creates a lot of um, unnecessary waste. And so one of the things we're working on is, um, is marketing um, reusable to-go containers. Um, and um, Dining Conference Services has purchased um, both clamshell um, to, to go containers and like soup size to go containers. Um, at this point, um, we have to work on getting having a marketing strategy that is going to really market these to the students because um, one of the issues that a lot of um, of Dining Conference Services sees is that they're going to be stolen, um, which is something that they've seen with um, the ceramic dishes and the sub every single year, um, and so trying to come up with a strategy to um, market them to students in a way that we're not going to, they're not going to just be like money going down the drain because um, we distribute them and then they, they get left in people's rooms and they never get brought back to, to dining conference services. So, um, so we have to kind of communicate with a bunch of different groups on campus and work together to kind of create a strategy so that everyone's kind of involved in Process. Have they ever thought of doing like some sort of like a rental service? Like I, if I remember correctly, I, I went to Gustavus for a semester. I, I remember that part. I went to Gustavus for a semester. I'm not forgetting that part. But if I remember, <laughs> if, I, if, I remember if, if I remember correctly, they also had to go containers that you could rent at the at the sub and that or like at the at their cafeteria yeah. and then you could check those back in and then get credit for it again. So that's, it kind of like got around that. That's what they're issue. planning. That's what the plan is at this point. Um, but. Um, right now, um, because there's not a lot of space for them, um, we have to figure out like a way to make room for them in the sub at the same time as um, being able to rent them out. So, um, yeah, that's that's obviously a, a really great way of, of dealing with it because that way they, there's an incentive to bring them back. All right, we're just about at the end of our hour, so... You guys have two like two events that you guys told me about that you wanted to make sure you got on the air. So, mm -hmm. one was this coal forum in Trimble. Uh, Annie, what can you tell me about that? Yeah, November twenty eighth. So, at the end of the month, we're having a coal forum, which is basically going to go over um, basically all fossil fuels and kind of like the science behind it and how that affects us as students and why we should care about that. Um, which we're going to have different professors. We speakers yet, but that'll be coming out soon. Um, the other thing is the Town Hall Forum, and that is on November 17th, and that is in the Trimble Forum as well, and that's going to be kind of going over sustainability on campus. Um, we're going to be getting a lot of people from different areas to talk about what work has been done and answer any questions about sustainability. All right, sounds great, guys. I want to thank all of you for coming in the studio. It's been a great show. This is the, yeah. These are the Students for a Sustainable Campus. Uh, you've been listening to Across Campus on 90.1 KUPS The Sound. We'll see you back. Well, we hope to have you listen in on the show again at the very same time next week. Take care, everybody.